All right. So you guys having a good time so far? Yeah. Woo! Good. Well, we're actually uh, half the way through Sunday right now. Uh, we'll actually be switching formats after this talk and start going into the uh, half-hour talks that are a little bit uh, shorter, obviously, and a bit more fast-paced. Um, so I think this is the last of our hour talks that we've got here. And we have Michael Wiley here who's speaking on You're Not Alone in Your Hotel Room, so please welcome him to the TourCon stage. Thank you. All right, so I just found out about... Uh, 10 minutes ago that the title of these, this talk is a little bit creepy, so maybe I should have thought about that, but I thought around the, the privacy concerns that we had around DEF CON about a month or so ago, this would be an interesting topic to talk on. So I'm Michael Wiley, I'm recently the Director of Cybersecurity Services at Richie May Technology Solutions. Uh, up until now, for the last about 12 years, I've run my own consulting firm in Los Angeles, and it's a bit of a change now to, to be an employee and uh, work for someone else, but so far it's been awesome and I've been working on a lot of great projects. This talk is, uh, I've had some legal input on it. So as the, the DEF CON concerns came around and people and security going into rooms, um, I got the input of uh, Dan Nelson, and so he's an attorney in Colorado. And so he helped with a couple of these slides and I'll, I'll call that out. And uh, I put his contact information towards the end. You can absolutely reach out to him if you want more information since I'm obviously not an attorney. Uh, I think he's a pretty interesting attorney to talk to, especially in this space, because he's one of a few attorneys that I've come across that understands privacy and information security. So I know Mark Rash is one of them that's out there, and uh, he makes a, a, a lot of blog posts and content around privacy and cybersecurity, but then Dan's probably one of the only attorneys I know of that has a certified ethical hacker and a couple other uh, security-related certifications. Uh, so about Richie May Technology Solutions, they've been around for about 30 years, but their cybersecurity information security programs come up for just in the last year or so, and that's why they brought me on board to help develop that and bring it up to speed. Some of the disclaimer, they obviously made me do this in the past, I wouldn't have to, but now we've got this on here that the information contained herein is general nature and based on the guidance is, that is subject to change. The information is not intended to provide legal or other professional services and is provided solely for educational purposes. The information provided should not be used as a substitute professional legal advice. Uh, uh, future changes in law regulation may supersede some or all of the topics in this article. And that's what I did find was a lot of the content that we found, uh, case law and other laws that came out, there's either not a whole lot out there quite yet around this talk, um, or they do change or they differ from state to state. So we're first going to talk about some recent privacy concerns. Uh, then we're going to go into the, host, the hotel's right to enter your room if you're staying there, the law enforcement's right to enter your room, Gambling with some free Wi-Fi in the hotel, we'll just briefly talk about that because I'm sure you all are, are experts in that area. And then uh, detecting intruders and physical access to your hotel rooms or Airbnbs, then detecting cameras that might be present in your room or more specifically your Airbnb room, and then some counter surveillance techniques. So this is where the, the talk really kind of came to light was uh, I actually didn't attend DEF CON this year. I had a bunch of uh, business trips lined up, but I was at B-Sides Las Vegas, gave a uh, talk there. And all of a sudden I started seeing all, aside from the, the storm that hit Vegas the day I left, this was all over Twitter and that people were saying, warning, Caesar staff is performing random security checks. And they were in certain cases coming in unannounced, other cases they were coming in with some announcement, but they were being a little aggressive with their security checks. Um, and so I've got a couple different tweets that I saw that, that got retweeted a lot on Twitter. But a lot of different situations, and I think one of the more scary ones was a female was in her room and she was in the middle of changing and security came into their room, uh, she claims, without knocking. So I first looked to the actual policy. I thought, well, these hotels have to have policies on what they can and can't do coming into your room, so we should start there. And with Caesars Entertainment, uh, it was the most interesting since they were in the light and we had these tweets about their, their privacy and entering uh, their guests' rooms. But they say, we do not comment publicly on security-related policies and procedures. And so that was one email that came out from one of their spokespersons, and that was uh, in November of, of the year before. I'm sure now that there was a big stink about their uh, entering rooms, they've come a little, been a little bit more transparent with what their policies are. But initially they said, we're not going to comment on this after the, the big shooting in Vegas. MGM was a little bit more transparent with what they were going to do in their policies, and they essentially said that 
Uh, all MGM resort properties follow health and welfare checks, operating procedures that stipulate welfare checks be to be performed after two consecutive days where do not disturb signs have been displayed on the door and guests uh, have not uh, interacted in person or by phone with housekeeping. So a lot of these policies come around because I'm seeing we all are pretty familiar with what happened in Vegas and the big shooting, and so they're trying to get more eyes and ears in the room. And if you don't want housekeeping in there, then they're okay with that, but they want to check on the room and make sure there's not a stockpile of ammunition or explosives. And if you think about how big some of these hotels are, especially in Las Vegas, sometimes there's up to like 3,000 rooms, and if you think few people in those rooms, it's a large target for some type of terror attack. So on one side, it's understandable that they would have some type of security to protect you, myself, our family that's visiting Las Vegas. Las Vegas and trying to have a good time, but there has to be some type of balance between the, the privacy of the guests as well as the safety of them. Uh, Hilton had a policy actually quite a long time ago, and it says, we understand and respect our guest privacy. The hotel reserves the right to visually inspect all rooms every 24 hours to ensure well-being of our guests and confirm the condition of the room. And understandable, they have a lot of money in these hotels as well. They don't want them damaged. Disney had one for a while, uh, for quite some time, and they made a little bit of a change after the October shooting. The hotel and its staff reserve the right to enter your room for any purpose, including but not limited to performing maintenance, repairs, checks on the safety and security of our guests and property. And after the October event, what they did is they took out the do not disturb signs and they replaced them with um, something that said like no cleaning service or no maid service needed. So that way it wasn't giving a false impression that by putting that sign up of do not disturb or do not enter, that wasn't going to always be the case. You're really just saying I'm, I'm basically declining the housekeeping service in my room. So those are the policies that they have forward, but I thought that's great that they have the policy, but what if you get your, your room checking card or your contract and you cross those things out? Is, is that legal? What about the law enforcement? Can they just let law enforcement come in because they see you have a soldering iron in your room and they don't know what that is? So this, these are the slides that Dan uh, contributed to and gave me some insight on. So he wrote these next few slides and unfortunately he couldn't join me here today. So the Fourth Amendment protects guest rooms from unreasonable search and seizure. And this is for law enforcement only. This is not to apply to the hotel and the security staff as well. But, the sole, um, but this solely applies to government agencies, such as the police. And even then, there are some exceptions, such as an emergency. So if they see there was one case where there was blood outside the hotel room and they heard a big crash of glass. And in those cases, they were allowed to uh, enter the room because they thought there was some type of bodily harm in that case. Also, the guests can consent. So if, if your husband or wife or someone else is in the room and they consent to the police to enter, they can come in without a warrant. The Fourth Amendment also protects uh, guests against registration information. So uh, one specific case that I thought was interesting in my hometown of Los Angeles was the city who came in and said, well, you, the police are allowed to come in and look at registration information. And there was another hotel that I think was somewhere around San Diego that it was a Motel 6, and the police were, or the ICE was asking for Im information on guests and trying to correlate that with immigration information. So there was two notable cases, but I like the one in Los Angeles since it's my hometown. And they ultimately, after it went up to circuit appellate courts, they came out and said that uh, the, even though the Los Angeles says that police can go in there and get registration information, that if the hotel does not want to provide it, they don't have to give it out. And it is protected by the Fourth Amendment. So now the hotel's right, and this is really what the, the talk's around. What about Caesar's Palace and entering some of the guests' uh, room, even though they were there, they said, hey, we don't want someone coming in. I saw one person posted a sign on their door, and they said, I do not give consent to have anyone search my room. So I thought, well, does that, is that valid? Can you supersede the contract that you sign when you check into the room? And so the Fourth Amendment does not generally apply to hotels and non-government actors, so there's no need for a warrant, even if you tell them, I do not consent to you entering my room. Uh, it's generally a state law, since there's not a whole lot about this uh, for a business and the contract between the business and someone coming in to stay less than 30 days. So it generally goes down to the state law, and as I mentioned, this is going to vary by every state that you go to. And the most interesting thing that I think Dan brought up is that the primary difference between a landlord and tenant, and I've got a couple of rental properties, so I'm familiar with California and Los Angeles laws on that, and you've got a lot different uh, or different set of laws when you have longer than 30 day leases. And so that's gonna be a landlord and tenant or tenancy, but if you're staying less than 30 days in a hotel room, you're generally considered it's a lessor lessee relationship and there's a lessee relationship. So essentially, it's similar to a parking garage. If you go into a parking garage and you get that little ticket, 
and it has a little contract on the back of the ticket that says they're not responsible for damage, you can stay for less than 24 hours, you know, this is the rate, this is et cetera, all that stuff, that's generally gonna be a less or lessy relationship as well. And you can't supersede that contract by writing in your own piece of the contract or putting something on the door after the fact saying that I don't agree to a search in that case. And so you have a lot less rights when it's a less or and lessee relationship. So uh, tenants actually um, have a property interest in the, the premises, but it's a lot less, um, I'm sorry, the tenants have a, a, a higher degree of property interest, which means they have more rights to the property than if you have a license to basically stay at the property like this hotel. Um, and so it's hard to, to claim that you're a tenant if you do stay less than 30 days. And so he's saying if you stay more than 30 days, like it's an extended stay and you're there for two months, unless they make you recheck in, and I know a lot of places will do this, even for a car, if you're renting a car, every two weeks you have to go back in and re-sign the license because they don't want it to be a tenant relationship. They want to keep it as a, a licensee. So what does this mean for you? So you as the, the licensor and the, or the, sorry, the licensor as the hotel will generally have the right to enter your room for legitimate reasons. And I think they're pretty uh, broad and vague. And so in this case, they, they can pretty much claim anything and come into your, uh, your premises there. So cleaning, maintenance, guests. So they can even say the safety of someone next to you. If they heard things going on in your room and it sounded like a gun loading, well, they can just come in because they assume that, or they're trying to protect the safety of the guests next to you as well. The hotel may, be back, um, may back this up with language in the, the license agreement, so when you check into the hotel, it may be directly on the actual contract. It could also be referencing a link somewhere else. So sometimes when you sign one of those end-user agreements, it says, for more information, go visit their website, which is kind of ridiculous when you're checking in with a long line. Um, and such uh, language is not essential to the hotel's right to enter, so they don't even have to fully call it out. They have a right being the, the building owner. So some do's and don'ts from Dan, the attorney. Uh, lock your room from the inside when you're present, right? So if you're inside there, it's a little bit harder for them to come in and do those security checks. Uh, there's obviously the locks on the doors, but I know people that have actually come to this conference and given talks about bypassing locks. Um, and obviously the keys have, or the, the hotel has keys to everything. So you can obviously use the locks on the hotel door, but there's a couple of techniques I'll give you that you can use your own locks or little uh, techniques that you can basically barricade yourself in for a legitimate reason. Um, if, you have the, if you have personal items that you don't want searched and looked at, um, the recommendation from Dan was put that in a suitcase with a lock. It's generally a lot more difficult for the hotels to claim safety concerns to going into your items. In that case, they may need to bring in law enforcement and have a, a warrant in those cases. So anything you don't want them to look at when you leave the room, lock it in a suitcase. Uh, don't do anything illegal. Obviously, he's an attorney, so he's going to put that in there. Uh, and if you do something illegal, then probably contact him and he can represent you. Um, so, essentially, uh, there was a couple of things in Vegas that were happening as far as uh, some of the, the guests were having soldering irons. And I get that the soldering irons aren't illegal and they may not be a safety concern or security concern, but you also have to think about it from the hotel's perspective. And if you have uh, someone that's, that's, I'm assuming, is low paid coming in to clean a room, or even maybe a security guard that's uh, in high school or maybe college and they're trying, that's an intermediary job. They come in, they see wires all over the place, circuit boards and a soldering iron. We understand what that that's probably is. It might be just a badge, but in their eyes, after the October shooting, that's a big concern for them. All these wires and electrical things out there. So just to save yourself, if you have those items, you may just want to put them away or tuck them in and they, the hotel probably doesn't have a right to go through your things, especially if it's locked up. So that just gets you out of that, that whole predicament altogether. I'm really going to touch a whole lot on the, the gambling with Wi-Fi. I mean, Wi-Fi anywhere. We just want to be careful with what we're, we're using and what we're doing. Obviously, the wall of sheep at DEF CON, there's tons of clear text data going across. Sometimes you don't even know what your computer or your mobile device is doing. So it might be best to use a VPN or a hotspot from your phone. The other interesting thing I do want to mention before moving on to the next slide is that uh, law enforcement can request permission to tap the hotel's Wi-Fi or their, their internet in general. And long as the hotel agrees, in those situations, they don't need a warrant. And so I have talked with FBI agents and certain cases when they were doing um, child pornography cases, they've gone to a hotel and say, we suspect there's someone here, can we tap into your network? And not only did they let them tap in the network, they basically gave them usernames and passwords to everything, whatever they wanted, they didn't want to get involved, they just said, go ahead in our IT closet, you can do whatever you want, you're the FBI. So even if they don't have a warrant, they still might be able to come in with the consent of the hotel and monitor what you're doing. 
So in detecting intruders, if you're in the room or even if you leave the room, you might want to know if someone has been in there or they've come into your room. So a couple different options. You can buy these portable door alarms on Amazon for under $20, and they, they detect uh, motion or uh, vibration on the door. So if someone ends up uh, knocking really hard or messing with the handle or opening the door, it'll sound an alarm. This would work if you're in the bathroom or you just want to know when someone's trying to get into your room. But if you leave, you're probably not going to know if that thing went off or not. The interesting one is audio and video recording. And there was a tweet that went out as far as the... Um, uh, on Twitter for the Caesar, uh, Caesar Entertainment uh, circumstance. And in those cases, someone from, I think, QueerCon uh, had a video recorder in their room. And there was a little debate from privacy people of whether or not they should actually release the audio recording because Las Vegas or Nevada is a two-party consent state. And so that audio recording may have been uh, violating state and or federal wiretapping laws. So there's a little concern about releasing some of those things. But the consensus from Dan, and I'm sure he's going to have all kinds of disclaimers saying this, but when we talked on the phone last week, he was saying, well, if you have a sign and you bring a sign that says, this room, we're doing audio and video recording, and it's very visible, and it's right in the front of the door. It may be or implied consent by them entering in and starting to move around and talking. It's almost like when you call Verizon or Dell or anyone, any tech support, and they say, by continuing the call, we're going to be recording it for security or monitoring purposes. And by staying on the phone call, you are essentially consenting to that. So he said that that could be, it would be kind of a, two different principles that you're butting up together, and there's not enough laws or case law regarding this that, that hasn't been tried and tested, but that may be an option to have that with a visible sign saying you are doing audio and video recording in your room. The other interesting one is something, is it paper or my favorite, let me pull this out. I thought it had it visible there, but those little do not disturb signs that they've now replaced with uh, no maid service, if those you hang them on the door, and sometimes when you quickly close that door, they get stuck in the door jam a little bit. Well, I purposely sometimes actually do that. So when I close that, I'm sticking it in slightly, and that way if someone else has entered my room, even with that signs on, then it's no longer gonna be stuck in that door jam, assuming they didn't swing it too hard, but it maybe gives give me some indication that there has been an intruder in my room. Um, you can also take a picture when leaving your room. This is a great one to see, not if someone's come in, but if they've messed with your things or they've touched your stuff. You can take a photo with your, your phone. There's also some apps out there from, I think it was an ex-Navy SEAL guy, and he lets you take a picture, upload it, and then you come back, take a picture again, and it'll show you certain items that have been moved or misplaced from your original picture. So detecting cameras, I think this applies more for an Airbnb situation. Um, in an Airbnb situation, um, there's been many cases where people have found hidden cameras in their room, and I often are concerned about that. When I go to an Airbnb, travel with my wife, uh, I, I don't know the person's house. There's stuff all over the place. It's not like a hotel that has reputation. It could be some owner that wants to spy in the bedroom or the bathrooms, and so it is a little bit of a concern to me. So you can inspect uh, private areas, so bathroom, bedrooms, you can look around. A lot of these different items now, these hidden cameras are so small, you can see the little holes here, even a cell phone charger or a power adapter, and there could be a hidden camera sitting inside there. Um, you can look for cables, uh, commercial tools that can help you. So there's one on Amazon for a little bit less than $300. It's going to go around and look for electrical and other frequencies, and it'll be able to tell you if there's something in the area. The commercial tools that really will find all spectrums of wireless and electrical frequency are going to be a couple thousand dollars, but you can get away with detecting most of the different frequencies for less than $300. The other thing you could use is your phone's camera. So if they're not buying special spy equipment and they've got IR sensors on the, their IR lights on the cameras, you can go around and just basically pull up your, your cell phone camera and you could look around with it. And if they use infrared lighting, you will be able to see a little bit of a glow there and that might detect some of the cameras in those situations. Airbnb has a policy as well that hosts must disclose cameras, but obviously that's not always gonna be the case. Uh, you're prohibited, regardless of disclosing it, to have it in bathrooms, bedrooms, and other private places. And then they also prohibit you from doing counter surveillance. So you as a guest, if you go in there and you're staying there, like the hotel situation where I said you might be able to get away with having an audio and video recording with a sign, they say unless the third party consents to being audio or video recorded, you as the guest cannot have a camera doing the recording. So what else can you do here before I, I end? 
Um, basic uh, visual detection of lights, smoke detectors, other things that, if possible, hidden cameras. You go on Amazon, eBay, look for hidden cameras, and you can look for those type of items. You can use your cell phone to look for infrared. You can use different, um, uh, the, I think this is the, the MAC-Q anti-spy hidden camera detector. That's the one for under $300. If you are familiar with different tools, or you have Kali Linux running, once you get on the wireless network, you can use something like NMAP to do a network sweep. Um, I like Net Discover because it's going to do an ARP request, and so if they have ICMP disabled on any devices, like a hidden camera, this is going to go and look on ARP, and there's not a whole lot of protections to protect against ARP, so unless they segment their network, you're probably going to be able to see that. And if it's an Airbnb situation, the, unless they are someone in this room, they're probably not going to set up the network where it's isolated and have different network for that, and it's all hidden. But even if it's hidden, you can go out and use something like Insider, I-N-S-S-I-D-E-R, and you can look for hidden wireless networks as well. There's a, an awesome tool that came out on GitHub, it's called Dropkick, and so if you run this on a network in an Airbnb situation, it's supposed to go look for certain models, popular models of, of cameras, and then it'll go ahead and actually do a denial of service on them and try and get them off the network if it finds it. A few apps you can get, Spy Hidden Camera Detector for iOS, uh, Hidden Camera Detector for Android, Net Analyzer, there's a whole lot out there, but those were a couple popular ones. And then one piece I, I want to go back and, and point out now that I have a couple more seconds on this is the other piece that you can do is this is the, my actual hotel room uh, here at the Westin. And this big piece at the top of the door, you can wrap something like a rope or a belt around and it'll prevent someone from getting in. So even if they have the key or they have bypass tools to go ahead and open up that little slider or the whatever type of tool they have there, if you put something around that top piece there that's supposed to have the door slowly close, a lot of times you can actually stop someone from getting in or most of the way in in those cases. If you don't have those do not disturb signs, you can go ahead and put just a piece of paper on the door jam. and obviously if it fell out or it's somewhere on the ground, you know someone's coming into your room. And then I thought this one was pretty creative as well because I wanted to have something that if you forgot your tools at home, you might want to still do intrusion detection or lock your door. You can use a fork from the hotel lobby if they have a, a restaurant or you can go to some other place and, and buy a fork if you really forgot all your tools here. And you can cut the fork in half or you can bend it and break it. You put the, um, you bend the tips of the end of the fork. It goes into the actual part that the, the lock goes into. And then you've got the, the long piece of the fork going across the door jam and it'll prevent someone from opening the door. And it's pretty sturdy at that case. I've tried this once. So a couple different techniques. You can buy a couple of products to protect yourself, or you can even use some free tools to um, protect your, yourself. Obviously not barricade yourself in a, in a bad situation, but if there was security pounding on your door, not identifying themselves, and you were concerned for your own safety, until the police got there, you could barricade yourself in and protect yourself. So that's it for my slide. I know they said it was the last of the, the hour talks, but this was, uh, at least in my schedule, a 20-minute one. And uh, I'm available for any questions. Yes? Um, what about the uh, hotel safes? Yeah, from, from my understanding, they would need more of a, a warrant for that situation. Um, but there's also, they, there are certain situations they could evict you very easily since you are not a tenant, but you're a, you're a lessee. And so they may be able to say, we evicted you, now we can go into those. But generally things are, are, when they're locked, they don't have the right to go into those things. Again, generally, there's a lot of like what ifs and a lot of this hasn't been tested out or a lot of cases that have been around this. But the general consensus is if it's locked, they don't have the right. What's that? With the, like the hotel safe versus if you brought your own safe in? Yeah. I wouldn't know on that one. That would be a question for, for Dan on where the, the line's drawn on those pieces. They can open them, but they aren't allowed to. Yeah, okay. and they do, they do have um, certain keys. A lot of times, though, I've actually lost my key or I forgot the code for it, or um, my wife likes to put uh, certain codes, but uh, she doesn't use the US way of doing the year, the month, and the date. And so it's backwards, and I lock ourselves out of that thing. And so I have had the hotel trying to come in, and it's not as easy as I thought. In some situations when they've, they've went to go open it up for us, they have to get a specialist, or they say, oh, we have to call the safe guy to come in. And it's been anywhere from 30 minutes to a couple of hours for them to unlock the safe for us. Any other questions? Yes. So, uh Um, I didn't see 
Yeah, I mean, that's the, the difficult part with a an Airbnb situation is that um, the, the really the people you go to, you could potentially try and call the police and say they're spying on you. Um, but really, the, the place to go is going to be Airbnb, and it's going to kind of be up to how they're going to handle that situation. So their policy that I read on the camera said that the disclosure of the cameras, even outside the property, need to be in the listing. So when you actually look and you're interested, in, before you even click go ahead and buy, and then maybe they email it to you in the background, it has to be on the, the page that they're actually advertising. So in those cases, yeah. But that's it. I've got another talk uh, coming up if you're interested. And then otherwise, after both these, I'll be around in the, the lobby and we can, we can go ahead and talk after that. Thank you very much. Sorry, I was looking that way for a little bit. And I was a little worried when they said the uh, 50 minutes.